just about 12.30, so we're going to get started. Before I introduce our speaker, I have some housekeeping items. First of all, welcome everybody to the Department of Geriatric Medicine Grand Rounds. This CME activity is jointly provided by the Queens Medical Center and the UH Jabsom Department of Geriatric Medicine. At this time, please enter the name and credentials of everyone viewing Grand Rounds for CME attendance purposes. As a reminder, evaluations are required for CMEs. You can find the evaluations by following the link. It'll be put in our chat at the end of this session. It's also on our email advertisement and on our website. CMEs will be sent out by our sponsor in mid-January this year. Your comments are very important to the planning committee and will be used to plan future programs. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Katie Melton completed her medical education at Des Moines University in Iowa. She subsequently completed internal medicine residency at the Tripler Army Medical Center. She then moved back to Iowa for fellowship training in hospice and palliative medicine in 2018. She currently serves as the Director of Palliative Medicine at Tripler Army Medical Center. Her position evolved through a joint venture between the VA Pacific Islands Healthcare System and the Defense Health Agency. This collaboration was designed to bring dedicated palliative care expertise to adult inpatients at Tripler, introducing an innovative concept for the institution. Dr. Melton piloted this new program on her own for the first one and a half years, starting in January 2022. The program's success and utilization surpassed expectations, and she has stayed busy enough to prompt team expansion in recent months. Congratulations. That's wonderful. During a typical workday, Dr. Melton splits her time between managing patients, communicating with their loved ones, teaching nurses, residents, medical students, and colleagues, as well as assisting other support staff with care coordination. On weekends, you can find her hiking with her family, and she never turns down an opportunity to snorkel, dance, or sing karaoke. What fun. We're going to have to have you perform at one of our department events, Katie. Thank you so much for joining us today, Katie. Thank you. Um, yeah, I often tell people that I feel would feel much more comfortable singing today's presentation rather than speaking it. <laughs> but um, yeah, just thank you um, so much for allowing me the opportunity um, to chat with you guys. I kind of made up a title for myself at Tripler because I haven't really been given one, but since I'm the only palliative doctor there, I guess I'm the director of palliative care, right? <laughs> um, and so, uh, and then, yeah, I, uh, since I know this is more um, geriatrics themed than palliative per se, I uh, also just like people to know, I feel like I have this like inner wannabe geriatrician inside of me because I really wanted to do the dual fellowship. But unfortunately, as I was pursuing my um, career goals and aspirations, I was also following my uh, military physician spouse. So I was geographically locked. And so I took what I could get. <laughs> But um, all right, so today um, I'm going to do a little refresher on effective communication from a more palliative perspective, even though I know that we probably talk about effective communication a lot. Um, and it sounds like, um, you know, there have been great uh, efforts, particularly at Queens, to try and have people go through vital talk and that sort of thing. I always think it's helpful to review um, communication tips and tricks. And so um, really, this is kind of an adaptation of other people's work. This is not my own, but I will be throwing in kind of... Um, some anecdotes, if you will, and my own personal experience, and sometimes what I find seems to work, and um, maybe uh, ways that have worked better for me to reframe and rephrase things. So um, we shall move on. Oh, is it going to work? Okay. Disclosures. I have none. I make no side money. <laughs> All right. So, <laughs> um, 
So for objectives, um, I mean, I'm always happy if someone at least walks away from one of my presentations learning and remembering and feeling empowered to use something. But since I had to come up with objectives, here's a few. I'm hoping um, by the end of this uh, presentation, you are at least going to have a better understanding of some of the fundamental principles um, of what makes communication effective, particularly for those dealing with complex, serious illnesses. And I'm hoping that you feel better able to navigate some of these difficult conversations, um, particularly with enhanced compassion and empathy. Uh, we are going to spend pretty much the whole time um, talking about kind of how advanced care planning in the traditional sense differs from the framework or roadmap of serious illness communication. So like what is different about those and what is the same? And then Ultimately, really, um, my hope is that by helping you feel more confident in practicing your communication skills, that ultimately this leads to empowering patients and their loved ones uh, when we're um, working through the shared decision-making process. So we will jump right in and start talking first about traditional advanced care planning. Um, I think uh, as palliative, uh, physicians and then geriat geriatricians, um, you know, we all clearly have something come to mind when we hear the term advanced care planning. And there's probably a lot of similarities, but some of us may um, have certain things that come to mind that are different than others. But um, basically, so the whole point of advanced care planning is that it's this process to try and help us understand and share someone's preferences, priorities, values to help guide future medical care. So it involves discussing and preparing for the future um, for a time that you become seriously ill and maybe unable to communicate your wishes. So um, how you'll see that's different when we talk about serious illness communication is that in theory, most of the time for traditional advanced care planning, you're not acutely sick, you are feeling better, and you're thinking about a time when you will. So the whole concept is a little bit more abstract, and I think sometimes it's hard to know exactly how we really are going to feel or, or what we're going to want to do in a certain situation really until we're in it. So I sometimes, um, when I'm working with learners, I can sense their frustration <laughs> when somebody has taken the time to complete um, advanced care planning, maybe has an advanced health care directive that indicates a certain set of preferences and wishes, and then they end up shifting, <laughs> and, like saying something else. But um, that really does speak to like, as much as we maybe try to prepare until we're really in it and facing the realities, we may not really know um, what our wishes are. So in the traditional sense, advanced care planning is not really intended just for those that are old or those that are ill. It's like acknowledging that crises can occur at any time. And so at any time, something could happen where we're not able to communicate our wishes. And so for most people, I think they think of advanced care planning as we take the time to produce a document for these wishes. So um, lots of people that may be an advanced healthcare directive, or hopefully at the very minimum, it's uh, figuring out some sort of surrogate decision maker for when you can't make decisions. Um, but, you know, maybe at times this also includes things like a pulse form, um, if maybe the person is a little bit older or is a little bit more sick, but not acutely so. Um, and the whole point, or what we're hoping for, is that by completing advanced care planning, it's going to increase the likelihood that you receive the care you actually wish to receive when you can't say so yourself. Um, and then ultimately, the hope is, too, that it decreases some of the burden and the guilt that's laid upon your loved ones um, when they're asked to make decisions for you. Sometimes that ends up being true, and sometimes not so much. <laughs> so... Uh, so advanced care planning at its heart really is like a patient-centered approach to providing medical care, but while it's great to have a document, and I am not by any means trying to say don't complete an advanced health care directive, don't have a surrogate decision maker, don't do a pulse, because I don't think they're helpful. I do <laughs> under certain circumstances, and I always think they can be a helpful tool to guide. Um, you know, it's like 
not helpful if there was no conversation around it, um, particularly between loved ones and the person completing the documentation or doing the advanced care planning, but then also with the physician. So all the time, I feel like particularly at Tripler, we have a new-ish um, EMR. And for me to try and figure out just through the EMR itself, if somebody has completed an advanced health care directive, is literally impossible. So there is no super simple, easy way to check it. I always have to like dig in these very mysterious ways. And most of the times it's not actually even in there. And, um, you know, or then sometimes it's like, you know, the patient's like, yeah, I think I filled one out, but I don't really know where we put it. Or the loved one was like, oh, I think it's in there safe. We can't access it. I don't know what it says. <laughs> so um, in those circumstances, it's not super helpful. And I think too, like, it's so important to just realize the conversation that needs to happen around this, because it can be really hard to interpret what someone's wishes are with no context. And so one particular example I wanted to give that I feel like I run into not infrequently in my line of work on the inpatient side of Tripler is so the Hawaii Advanced Healthcare Directive under like the section where it's end of life decisions, you can mark this one box that says, I want medical treatments that would prolong my life as long as possible within the limits of generally accepted healthcare standards. But I guarantee you if I lined up like 15 doctors and asked what are generally accepted healthcare standards, they're all going to give me a little something different. So it is a little gray. It's sometimes hard to really interpret what people mean when you haven't had a conversation and you have no context to understand why they picked what they picked. So um, within the field of palliative care, like <sighs> advanced care planning in and of itself has kind of been fraught with more controversy uh, lately. Like some people have done studies where they suggest that they're really not as helpful as we thought they were. And so maybe we shouldn't putting, be putting so much effort into them. So, you know, it's kind of like, we know the conversation should be held further upstream, but which patients should we prioritize to have these conversations with? How far upstream should we start them? Then once we have them, how often do we revisit it? Is it like uh, we should just do it once a year? Should it be every other year? Should it only be if something major changes? Um, and then one thing I think too is like, it's always, it's kind of whose responsibility is it on the medical side? We are all very, very busy. I don't foresee that changing anytime soon. And so when we can shove off responsibilities, especially things that may take be a little more time intensive and a little more emotional, um, you know, to like, put that onto somebody else or just assume somebody else is going to take care of that. Um, when we all know the reality is it's probably not happening. <laughs> um, I think, you know, a lot of times, for example, like I see um, primary care physicians, you know, they're kind of thought to be the throughput for everything. So like they should be the ones to, to help patients through advanced care planning. But, you know, if they have cancer, usually their PCP appointments start to become less and less and their oncology appointments become more and more. So then it's like, well, no, the oncologist should be having these um, conversations, but the oncologist is like, I'm busy. The PCP should be having these conversations. So, um, those are just some of the controversies that we've been talking about on the palliative side when it comes to advanced care planning. So really, though, when it boils down to it, despite all of the challenges and like the questioning of how valuable it is, I mean, patients and their loved ones, they they want to be engaged in medical decision making, but it's like really distressing and really stressful. And if we can learn to become better communicators and normalize this and kind of do it in a more consistent fashion along the way, um, we can help to lessen that distress or potentially even um, prevent it. So now we're going to talk a little bit more about serious illness communication specifically. So this has become um, a little bit more common of what we are striving for on the palliative side of things, particularly in the last few years. Uh, so to start off with, a serious illness entails having a health condition that carries a high risk of mortality and either negatively impacts a person's daily function or quality of life or excessively burdens and strains their caregivers. 
So the framework of serious illness communication focuses on the illness experience that's happening currently. So unlike, you know, traditional advanced care planning where it's, you know, we're looking towards the future because we're feeling okay right now, um, serious illness communication is more like in the moment while things are changing. So it's, it's communication that should be happening with a provider who clearly has like the medical knowledge and background, so gets the medical side of it, but is able to create a safe space for the patient and the family to not only like understand the illness itself, um, but also like how that's going to impact their life now and moving forward and like what it really means for their life now and in the future. And so again, like normalizing this discussion along the way serves to help build a more therapeutic relationship. So the framework or roadmap of serious illness communication, it is very scripted. I feel like it borrows a ton from the things we learn in, in vital talk or um, you know, if we're trying to teach learners how to run a family meeting or how to give bad news, a lot of it is the same. So um, it's it's a structured intervention in which the clinician does in this order these specific things, and then we're going to kind of piece them out individually after this slide. So we want to assess how much the patient knows and what they want to know about their illness and their prognosis. We want to share information according to their preferences. We want to be sure to respond empathically to emotion and not just with like canned phrases because we've learned we're supposed to be empathic. <laughs> um, we don't just hand a tissue box. <laughs> That's not enough. Um, we, we then go on to explore the patient's values, their priorities with open-ended questions to really hear from them. And then... If it's indicated in the right time, making a medical recommendation about the next steps for care. And so this sort of um, framework should be revisited multiple times throughout the illness trajectory because the vast majority of the time, this is not a one and done um, conversation. Uh, and so ultimately, like how often these sorts of specific conversations occur and who all is involved really depends on what's going on and how things are going. So um, this is, we're gonna stepwise go through it in a little bit more detail, but if you want to um, Google for yourselves, the Serious Illness Conversation Guide, there are various forms, different institutions have come up with their own example phrases uh, that they like to use. And so usually um, they're like one to two page reference sheets that kind of recap what I'm gonna talk about now that I think are really good um, resources to use when you're getting ready to like have a serious conversation with a patient to kind of like get yourself in the right mind frame and and um have some some specific communication strategies ready to go <laughs> to set you up for success so step one and again it is important the order we do this in you want to set up the conversation so you want to introduce the idea of having this conversation and why it will be beneficial to do it um, and then you know very important to ask their um, permission to to move forward in this conversation so um one example I have here is I'm hoping we can talk about where things are with your illness and where they might be going. Is that okay? Um, or I'd like to speak with you about what lies ahead with your illness in advance so I can better understand what's important to you and make sure we're providing you with care that aligns with what you're hoping for. Is that okay? Step two is going to be assessing the illness understanding and information preferences. So, uh, you know, some examples for that first one is are the assess illness understanding. What's your understanding of where you are with your illness? Or sometimes I phrase it like, um, like, tell me, tell me what's going on with your health right now. Or if I know this is someone who 
uh, like normally <laughs> doesn't really give me a lot and I kind of have to pull stuff out of them. I may be like, tell me how things are different now than they were six months ago, just to kind of like start getting the ball rolling to help me get a better sense of like what they appreciate and understand. And then for assessing information preferences, it might be asking how much information about what is likely to be ahead with your illness would you like for me to share with you? Or another example um, that I read that I kind of liked was how much of an overview of your illness trajectory and future expectations would you like or are you ready for? So for step three, um, sharing the prognosis. So important here to tailor the information that you provide to the patient's preferences. And I cannot stress enough the importance of allowing silence and being, um, being empowered to name and explore emotion and validate the experience that the patient and their loved ones are going through. So I gave one example here, um, but we're going to expand on this a little bit in the next slide. So um, sharing prognosis can be as simple as that short statement I put there. I'm worried that time may be short. And then you stop. Stop talking. <laughs> Allow for some awkward silence. And I guarantee you, um, whatever finally comes out after, in that awkward silence from the patient or their loved ones is going to tell you what is at the forefront of their mind and help guide the conversation moving forward, rather than you feeling uncomfortable in the silence and just jumping in and moving on. <laughs> so a few more things about prognostication. So it is so important for a patient and or their loved ones to understand, truly understand their illness and what to expect for the future, which means understanding their prognosis to some degree in order to be able to plan and prepare for the future and make the most informed decisions they can about their care. If they do not understand it, how can they possibly make informed decisions? So, but this is really scary for us on the clinician side because there's a lot of uncertainty or we don't want to say the wrong thing. We don't want to be wrong um, or we don't want, um, you know, we don't want them to lose hope. I hear those sorts of things all of the time. But the thing is that I almost all of the time, there are rare, always rare exceptions, but almost all of the time. When I ask a patient if they want to be more aware of their prognosis, they say yes. So they're afraid to ask, but they want to know. And then usually, even if it's not great, they're relieved <laughs> to hear and to be a little more in the know. And I feel like it's actually ends up being a relief for us on the clinician side too, that it's like kind of finally out there and we're not just like talking about it behind closed doors. And so one thing to keep in mind though, is that the way people want to hear prognostic information is not always going to be the same. And I think that most people, when they think about giving prognosis, they automatically think about like a time frame. Um, so I'm going to share how much time we think they have left. But for some patients, this is not really helpful. And I think particularly like an example I can give is a patient with advanced cancer, but maybe the oncologist is saying, well, you might have a couple of years. Like that's still quite a large amount of time that it's, it's hard to kind of think about what's important for the future when we're thinking that far ahead. So, um, if we use the framework of serious illness communications, we can still focus the information that we give about the uncertainty um, about what's coming and maybe come up with like other prognostic things that may be even more helpful. Like what do we expect might happen with your functional status? Um, do we need to start thinking about, are you gonna need more help? Um, 
are you going to be able to still live in a place where you have to walk up two flights of stairs to go to your bedroom? Those sorts of things. Um, that can be prognostic information. So, um, and then I think just, again, reiterating that, like, of course, these conversations are going to be emotional. These, um, as we start to appreciate um, these changes that are coming, there's a lot of anticipatory grief. And I think it's our responsibility to like verbalize how tough this is and acknowledge and validate um, like how difficult this is, but that we're gonna keep walking with them. So here are some um, actual examples or how we might share prognosis depending on those preferences that the patient and or their loved ones gave us for how, like what kinds of information they wanna hear and review. So uh, here is where, you know, we borrow the classic palliative, like hope, worry, or wish, worry statements. Um, and you'll notice that we try to avoid using, you know, yes, but. <laughs> so um, when we're talking about a prognosis that really is uncertain, uh, phrasing such as it can be difficult to predict what will happen with your illness, I hope that you're gonna have some great time left to live, though I worry that things could change really quickly and it's important to prepare for that possibility. Uh, if this is a situation where maybe it is more beneficial to give a time-related prognosis or that's what information the patient or family wants, um, it can be worded something to the effect of, I wish we were not in this situation. I worry that time may be as short as, and then I put in the parentheses, expressing ranges of time. So um, I, oh, even just last week, <laughs> like was invited into a consult after first conversations had kind of already happened. And the, the learning team had laid the framework of like, they will, your loved one will only have 48 hours. And literally when they told me they said that, I'm like, you have for sure guaranteed for me, they're gonna at least live two weeks. So like, do not box yourself in to very specific timeframes because you will be wrong. Um, and so, um, and even when I give like a time frame of, I think based off of my best estimate, um, the way things are going, we may be looking at days to weeks. I still leave some room for, um, for error, if you will. So um, I always say, you know, but things can be unpredictable. Certainly if the situation changes, um, you know, your loved one could worsen quickly and that time frame might be shorter. And sometimes people surprise us and they end up living longer. And so we're, we're gonna walk with you and navigate it either way. Um, then when it comes to function, so, uh, one way that that might look is, while I hope this is not the case, I worry this may be as strong as you're going to feel, and likely here soon things are going to get more difficult. And again, that would be where you would stop talking. <laughs> stop talking, allow for some silence, and let that just kind of um, punctuate the thoughts of those that you're having the conversation with and see what they bring up next, and that helps guide your conversation forward. It really will help you know what they are worried about and what is on their mind. So that's kind of why the next step is exploring key topics. So this is where you're gonna get more into eliciting, okay, what are my patients or their loved one's goals? What are they worried about? What are they hoping for? What brings them strength? Is this someone that um, you know has a really strong faith base and so they turn to their faith when times get hard? Um, critical abilities, meaning like what abilities is super important to that person to feel who they are that it would be devastating to lose? Um, maybe exploring what trade-offs somebody's willing to go through. And then certainly here is our time to explore what our patient's support network um, is or what it could be and trying to activate that early. So when we're exploring goals with our patients, it's super important to ask open-ended questions. And so 
it's also not uncommon that I hear um, kind of with, with a newer learner who maybe this is their first time and they're like tr testing the waters of running a family meeting and they'll say something like, um, you know, we're meeting today to kind of figure out what the, your goals for your health are. And like, that's a little too vague. I feel like everyone kind of looks at each other awkwardly and they're like, I don't really know how to answer that question. So um, these examples here give a little more guidance on like different ways to maybe phrase it and, and, and uh, get more headway out of where to go. So even that first one is a little bit more specific than the statement I said, be said before. So what are your most important goals if your health worsens? What are your biggest fears or worries about the future with your health? Um, there is kind of the phrase that I was alluding to before, like what abilities are so critical to your life you cannot imagine living without them? That may be where somebody, you know, you learn that this is the type of person who, um, like their sense of independence is, is, um, something they identify with strongly. And so there's going to be some existential suffering that they're going to deal with if they have something like dementia, where we know, um, the natural history and natural progression of that over time is going to be loss of independence. So, um, you know, that knowing that about them can help us um, guide conversations and planning for the future. And then how much are you willing to go through for the possibility of gaining more time? And super important, how much does your family know about your wishes? Because again, providing loved ones with context for why your choices are what they are is really what might help relieve the guilt and burden if we have to turn to them to make decisions. And so then at the bottom, I just threw on something that I think is worth mentioning um, and thinking about and remembering at times is um, small adjustments in the way that we say things. Um, can really do a lot. And so um, I put there, avoid what would your loved one want? So I feel like I have sat in many family meetings in an ICU setting, for example, where, um, you know, we've, we've assessed what their understanding is and we've moved into the, where we're clarifying medical data and where things are at. Um, and we've reached the point where we've maybe given a bunch of options for how we can move forward. And then we're like, so what would dad want? And that is really, I find that to be really overwhelming to answer um, for loved ones. And particularly when they're given like multiple potential pathways, we kind of feel like it's our duty when we're respecting autonomy to present all of the potential options, even if some of them are really terrible options. <laughs> um, so um, a slightly better way that I think helps the conversation, um, more cleanly move forward is manipulating that a little bit to instead, after you've maybe touched upon some of the options, it's, you know, what would grandpa think about this? Or what would grandpa say about this if he heard what we were talking about? And again, allowing some space for silence and seeing what they say and moving from there. All right, then um, step five, closing the conversation. So you want to summarize what you've heard. Um, if it's the right place and time, make a recommendation. Uh, I would say, don't be afraid to make a recommendation, especially if they've given you, if you've asked permission and they've given it to make a recommendation. What I find is that sometimes um, loved ones or patients kind of have an idea of what they want, but they're like a little worried how that will come off to their care team. And so they don't necessarily want to tell us, but when we give a re recommendation, particularly if it aligns with what they were thinking, it really can help them feel significantly relieved about any guilt they were feeling about their choice. So, um, and in my experience, like I have, you know, I think you need to make it clear that just because you give a recommendation, like 
nothing bad is going to happen. You know, care is not going to stop if ultimately they choose not to go with your recommendation. <laughs> so um, I think all that to say, just like, don't be afraid to give a recommendation. <laughs> and then important to affirm your commitment to the patient. So after all of that conversation has happened, you've taken the time to assimilate and appreciate what the patient's goals are. And you've thought about what the options are for them realistically moving forward. It's, you know, you can say something to the effect of, given your priorities and what we know about your illness at this stage, I recommend XYZ moving forward. How does this sound? We will do everything we, we can to help you through this. So particularly if this happens to be a situation where like in the hospital, if we are at a point where we have had enough conversations that we are reaching an actual decision and we decide to shift our focus towards comfort, patients and their loved ones do not want to feel abandoned. So that affirming your commitment is so important and really helpful. And again, I just wanted to um, highlight the importance of language and word choice. So I specifically put this slide up because um, there was an article um, in JAMA earlier. Well, I guess now it's 2023 so in, or 2024. So in 2023, there was um, this article in JAMA that talked about um, how we use the word need um, and how it's usually not helpful when we're having conversations. So they gave the example of if your mother's breathing gets anywhere, she will need to be intubated. And this can be misleading. I think especially um, for those that are seriously ill when we have no idea what their goals and preferences are, because that may not be true. They may not need to be intubated, but the word, when you use need, it's describing both what is lacking, but then also what is the required action to respond. So when patients or families hear that, it's really hard for them to move beyond like, well, the doctor said I needed this, so that's what we should do. Um, it really allows no space at all for like deliberation about what's actually best and particularly based off a of person's goals and desires. Um, and it it's not like taking time to acknowledge like, hey, there's been a serious shift in clinical condition. What does this mean? Like now and moving forward for this patient. And the problem that I see, um, so like when I've seen this play out in actual family meetings is oftentimes like the intensivist, for example, even though they said it that way, my conversations in the pre-meeting with them, they actually do not think intubation is the appropriate answer here. Like they do not think it would meaningfully contribute to the patient's um, disease trajectory. So then when they're getting the sense that like, oh, maybe family didn't really understand what I was saying, we try to start backtracking. And that just starts to like, seed or you know sow some doubt and there's some miscommunication and particularly if there are family members that are maybe not really aligning um it's a setup for conflict down the road so again small adjustments um can really really change it so they recommend like just one succinct statement um of like the clinical facts of how things are going. So in this case, it would be your mom's breathing is getting worse. So instead of, if it keeps getting worse, we need to intubate it. Can we talk about what this means and what to do next? So you're not planting the idea of what needs to be done. <laughs> it allows space to talk about what options are and figure out together, like what really is the best path moving forward. And I just wanna highlight that I by no means I'm trying to say that like I get this right 100% of the time, not even close. <laughs> um, I too am always like adjusting um, or you know, I kind of pay attention to facial expressions and body language and it's like, oh, okay, that didn't really land correctly, it seems. And so, you know, I think about it on my own, um, you know, how, how maybe can I try that again next time? All right. And then last step, 
Step six, so documenting your conversation and then giving proper handoff to your colleagues. So after you've taken the time uh, to you know have these conversations, we have to document it. And I think even more importantly, because like I said, these are almost never one and done conversations. Um, and it may not always be you know, you having the next conversation, it's um, relaying to your colleagues, like I talked with the patient about this. These are the things I learned. These are the things I noticed. I think based off of that, that the next time you go talk to them, I would try this, or I would like focus your conversation on this and try and help your, help your colleagues out so we can keep moving the conversation forward. All right. So, um, serious illness, the framework of serious illness communication, um, how does it help with decision making? Well, when we give more time to reflect or kind of we reflect over time as things change, uh, you will find that it's more natural and less jarring when patients reprioritize their goals or maybe change things like we see sometimes with the more traditional um, advanced care planning. And then when the need for an acute, like acute decision making does arise, this more structured approach helps to make it a little bit more of a humanized decision making process. And really, this ultimately is the way that we provide more personalized medical care, we respond more empathically, we have better buy in from our patients, and we get more satisfaction out of the relationships and how we've helped them walk this path as well. So when they've done studies on utilizing the framework of serious illness communication specifically, um, it says that, you know, despite the obvious challenging circumstances that these patients face, those that have engaged in it have a better understanding um, of difficult prognostic information. They have an easier time recalibrating their hopes and prioritizing their goals, particularly as their condition and trajectory changes. And then they have um, their medical decisions are, end up being more consistent with their values when the time actually comes. So it's so important to keep having these iterative conversations to build that trust and rapport, but even more so just illness awareness. Um, and I think the one thing within like the palliative perspective of why serious illness communication is important is that it's not necessarily always about, you know, completing the document or being able to mark the check boxes in the EMR <laughs> um, that we got certain things done. It's about like conversations along the way that all bring something valuable to the table that are going to enhance the shared decision-making experience. So some of the benefits when we've studied using a serious illness communication framework is um, it strengthens, strengthens the trust and relationship between the patients, their loved ones, and the care team. Um, patients and their families definitely feel more supported. They feel um, a more sense of purpose and control despite um, uncertain circumstances. It helps them to feel like they're live, living more normally because it's taking into account like what's at, what actually matters to them. Um, and it's like a natural way to start to probe the psychological and existential work that comes with having serious illness. So these patients seem to be able to have a easier time finding balance of like what they're hoping for um, for the future based off of a better understanding of their illness trajectory. And ultimately, I feel like, um, well, not just I feel, but it, studies have also shown that it really does reduce um, the, the medical team's moral distress. So this quick is um, just a graphic. So um, over the past couple of years, the Jerry Pal podcast has had numerous podcasts about both traditional advanced care planning and serious illness communication. So this was Dr. Alex Smith's um, graphic that he came up with on like traditional advanced care planning, serious illness communication framework, showing how they are different um, and how they are the same. Uh, so my hope is that um, 
I'm going to be able to provide you guys access to the slides so that if you want to like see these things later, you certainly can. Um, but I could say many things as a part of a conclusion, but I didn't want to just re-go over everything I've been talking about the past 40 minutes. So um, basically it's advanced care planning and serious illness communication. They're on a spectrum. Um, they both have their time and place. Um, I just think that the focus um, realistically to be the most beneficial needs to be less on check boxes and more on the journey. And again, I think super helpful and important is just Googling um, the serious illness conversation guide, printing off those one to two page sheets that goes over that framework, the stepwise framework that we talked about um, before you're getting ready to have these conversations with your patients. And so there are my resources, and that is it. <laughs> Baby, thank you so much for an excellent presentation. Let's open it up now for questions. Does anybody in the audience have any questions or comments? Uh, we're a small enough group that feel free to just unmute yourself and talk. If you prefer, you could put something in the chat box as well. But please unmute and ask your question. Anyone? Michaela just said we will be posting the PowerPoint with the recording. So if there were people who were not able to attend today's Grand Rounds, they can certainly watch the recording and have access to the slides as well. Thank you, Katie, for giving us that. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Or comments? We have a lot of communication experts in the audience. Well, I can I ask a question? Of course, of course. <laughs> Is there ever going to be a time when these sorts of things will be in person again? Because I still feel like I've never actually met so many people. <laughs> I know their names. Well, I sort of know some faces, but I've never actually talked in person. <laughs> so, you know, we're having various department uh, events in person. In fact, one is just this Thursday, but I don't think you're able to come, Katie. Yeah. Fortunately. But we are trying to have more and more events in person. For Grand Rounds, we've decided to keep them online just because the attendance is a whole lot better that way. Mm -hmm. It's just so much more efficient for people than having to, you know, drive yeah. and park and all of that. So we had a lot of comments from our faculty and fellow saying, yeah. please keep this online just because it's much more accessible. But no, yeah. we do want to have more and more events in person so that we can meet. I'm just seeing some things in the chat. Uh, so um, I wanted to tell you, I agree, Katie. I feel like, oh, New Year's resolution, let us see people again. So um, for folks who don't know about palliative poo-poos, Dr. Fishberg and I have been running this for, I don't know, 15 years or something. Every other month, it's a palliative care case discussion. Um, during the pandemic, it moved online. And we are bravely going to have the, the one in January is virtual and the one in March will be back in person at Queens. So uh, you can come. Come early, stay late. Uh, the poo-poos will be better, uh, you know, than my usual one sitting at home. But in all seriousness, it's a great conversation. It's a palliative care case discussion, usually. Um, and it, you know, there's there's always things to be talking about. And we try for the whole team to present, doctor, nurse, social worker, chaplain. Um, so those are announced through the Kukua Mau newsletter. So people are, you know, please sign up for that. And um, then the, so what we're, yes, Naomi, we're going to be doing hybrid version so people can still call in, but um, Bristol Hospice is actually doing in March and that's good because they have very good poo-poos because they have a budget for that. So they will be bringing poo-poos and we can bring our own, but seriously. So Katie, 
if nothing else, uh, you can we can meet uh, in March, and people are very welcome. Um, I had a question actually. You know, one of the hopefully people know that Kakua Maui have resources, including that advanced directive with that question. Um, we really have focused a lot on who is your healthcare power of attorney. And we started a you know, number of years ago really to turn it around and say, let's just start with who's important to you. And we find that conversation is, and then I love how Daniel Fishberg often says too, we wanna to understand people's philosophy, which is why I like the advanced directive that the free one that's on the website, cause it helps to talk about that. I totally agree. We have so many people who like think they understand about CPR and oh yes, we need this, that, and the other thing. It's like, you didn't go to med school and why are you talking about this? So, um, and one of the things I, I would like to understand is, is there a way to, I, 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 I feel your pain with the EMR from the meta, from the, from Tripler, but obviously we would like to in some way positively interact with all of those, the military folks. So I don't know if that's, a possibility. I, I believe that people, you still can use the post form and the advanced directive. But um, anyway, if you have ideas about how we from the civilian world, uh, especially if Kukua Mao can interact with you, um, you know, let me know. And certainly from, you know, listening to Pat Nishimoto and people from the VA over all the years, um, it is certainly a challenge to try to get the military to, to talk a little bit differently. But I think you, I agree that it's something that everyone can, can really be working on. Yeah, I think, so it's interesting since I started this um, unique, if you will, position <laughs> at Tripler, um, I've kept like a little log and one of the things that I look for or that I track is on the patients I'm consulted on when I'm first, when I first learn about them, do they have advanced directives completed? Um, and if yes, can I actually access them myself already? Um, or is it just, they're telling me that they do, but I don't have them. And then how many get completed like during their hospital stay and then how many just like don't have them and don't want to do them. And I'm actually quite, I was surprised the number that had actually done it was higher than I would have guessed. Hmm. Great. One of the um, challenges we are finding both in the hospital setting and in the nursing home setting is where these advanced directives are put in the AMR. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely variable and often difficult to find. Mm -hmm. And that's Absolutely. something that I think we need to get more standardized so that you can find them easily in an emergency, which is when you need to find them quickly. Yeah. And, you know, I would love to have a conversation about that, Kamal. For many years, we have tried through the HHIE to have like a post registry or advanced yeah. directive registry. Uh, Daniel and I can tell you war stories about how that is just not possible because it gets added as another document. So it's, you know, 27 documents in and everyone has their own EMR. Um, you know, certainly it seems that what Queens and HPH and Kaiser have done of making those documents very findable is really good. Um, I have... There's then, of course, all the other ones. So I would, you know, be very happy to work on that. Because again, what's the point of, you know, right. doing it? And then it, with Pulse too, we were just talking with someone whose auntie had a Pulse. It was on the fridge. EMS came. And now they have no Pulse. So how did yep. they get that? Yep. What did they do? You know, so this is, I think, that I, th I think that's an interesting um, opportunity like Kamal, are you talking about like doing something with nursing homes or? Well, I know I see Lauren Okamoto's on the call. Lauren, oh. do you want to talk about your experience at one of our nursing homes? Oh, hi. Sorry. So um, 
basically, so just I just kind of focused on a small project in one of the nursing homes that I'm the medical director of, and and we we had that exact problem where you know documents were coming in sometimes in the hospital EMR, sometimes in paper, sometimes in a paper chart. So we created a whole advanced healthcare director post team quality improvement project where we were able to locate all of these verify them and put them in the EMR in a locatable area for the nursing home, at least for those patients that were in that particular home. But it wasn't easy. <laughs> just and, and still, they're not totally accessible to everyone, as you said, because the EMRs are not talking to each other. So we might have them in point click care, but they may not be readily electronically available to another healthcare system. So I think this is something we should look into if we could improve that. Um, this was just a small scale project that we did, but we were able to get like 90, I don't know, 98% of them done. Um, but it did take buy-in from administration, medical records, everybody had to be on board. Yeah. You know, Lauren, I'd love to learn more about that. Can I ask which which facility was that? Uh, Haleho Aloha. It's a smaller nursing home in yep. Pacific Heights. Yeah. But, you know, we had, with the support of admin and the leadership there, so everything went really smoothly for us. Um, but we started off with only 30-something percent of the patients having the documents in the correct place or mm -hmm. having them available. Yeah, and then it went up with everybody on board to 98%. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's interesting because it's, on the other hand, people have metrics that they have to meet. And my fear always is, as Katie says, you know, the bane of our existence are these little check boxes. And I hate the question, you know, do you have an advanced directive? Yes, no. And no is also an answer. You know, my, it's like, if you're gonna have one question, where is your advanced directive? But Again, like you say, you need admin buy-in. You need to have people appreciate the value of this. So again, yeah. but that's what Kukua Maui been. We keep trying. I was just talking to somebody <laughs> yesterday. Oh, we'll come and talk to your family council. Oh, we'll talk to your staff. We'll, because people really don't know what that is. So Lauren, I'd love to learn more about that um, and to okay. see what you did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll contact okay. you. Okay. Yeah, I was and totally if someone else can... wants to, or Kamal, if you want to, to join in. Oh, I... yeah, we're well, both Kamal. <laughs> no, yeah. it's it's really important because, you know, the documents are great, but if you can't find them, you can't right. use them. Right. And that's been part of the problem. So, again, right. the right. EMRs don't all talk to each other. Epic doesn't talk to Epic sometimes. It's kind of crazy. And even... Yeah. Within a specific EMR, not everybody puts it in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. So, and for those yeah. that didn't have it, our social work department there is on board with, you know, counseling the family, providing them with resources. There's also one or two patients that actually can identify a decision maker. So we're going to help them with the guardianship process kind of thing. But mm -hmm. it does require a lot of work and everybody being on board and interprofessional yeah. team <laughs> yeah right yeah but like getting on that sooner rather than later is so helpful <laughs> yeah rather yeah. than yeah. waiting till the crisis hits and then the I mean crisis. that's how it works at tripler it's always wait till the crisis mm. but <laughs> yeah pr prevention right prevention of crisis it's so yeah. much better and I mean I we, we all I have so many stories of people who checked because we always say to pe people always in our talks, they're like, oh, I did this already. OK, which is why it's good to have like a two parter. So you go home, you find it. Oh, my ex-husband was the key right. person in this. Right. Or, oh, my friends died, actually, who are the people. I mean, and those are sort of simple ones, but everyone thinks they've done it. Oh, I taken care of this already. I, I had to see because I'm a notary. I did advanced. I saw an advanced directive last week with no health care power of attorney. I said, how much did you oh. pay for this? She paid oh, no. $350 for 17 pages of check boxes of, you know, if the tortoise runs over my foot and the what, uh, sorry for making <laughs> jokes, but it was like, this is so not going to help. 
But anyway, I think, Lauren, that is a great idea. Just, you know, having the leadership looking at that. And and there's some low-hanging fruit, I would imagine, of people who think they've done it. Right, right, right. And then, like, as Katie was talking, and May is so great today, Katie, how do you have these conversations? How do you not freak out the family? How do you get people to actually talk about it? Thank you. So again, back awesome. to my thing, if we can help Tripler in some way, uh, let me know. Thank you so yeah. much for a wonderful discussion. Are there any last questions? If not, Michaela has put the uh, CME evaluation link in the chat. So everyone, please fill out that form if you want to get CME. And again, I wanted to thank Katie for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you for teaching our trainees as well. Well, thank you. Okay, see you all again next month.